Hi Booktube, my name is Juan, I am Just One Reader, and today I would like to recommend Turtles All the Way Down by John Green. It's a book that took me only a few sittings to read, I finished reading it yesterday, and I wanted to discuss it here, no spoilers. So, in many ways, I think this one is your typical John Green kind of young adult novel. Um, it doesn't really have a plot, it's not really driven by a plot, um, this applies to most of John Green's books, but this one especially is very plotless. Um, it's really more driven by characters and by this kind of kooky, weird, eccentric, whimsical conversations between these really colorful, quaint characters that are really hard to believe. I mean, they really... They never talk the way that real teenagers would talk, I don't think, at least I'm talking from my own experience. Um, it, it feels sort of far-fetched and almost otherworldly, highly metaphorical. You know, um, there's a, a, a point to be made about criticizing John Green because he always comes up with the same kinds of characters. I'm not saying that it's the same character all over again, but it certainly is that kind of heightened reality of what a what a teenager is. Um, but I still have always found his books, his characters, his uh, portrayal of these characters to be very entertaining and sometimes actually quite enriching. And the, his books are some of the only young adult books that I that I have read and that I still want to keep reading because I even though I don't love them, um, there's always something to appreciate in them, in my opinion, and I think they are pretty valuable experiences, especially if you are in this age group, um, in, you know, in your teenage years, I think they would be fairly important reads. Um, but I wanted to recommend this one in particular, Turtles All the Way Down, because I think it talks about many things that are necessary to think about and to include as part of the conversation with younger audiences. This book, like I said, doesn't really have a plot. I mean, it's very, very hard to find a discernible plot in this, but it's not really about a plot. It's more about John Green discussing mental illness through his character in this particular book. The protagonist is this girl, her name is Aza, I think that's how you pronounce it, it's a fictional name, it's it's a name that he invented, of course. Um, um, Aza um, has a very acute, incredibly severe psychopathology, and here, I mean, we need to take a step back, um, because this is fiction, so of course the portrayal of mental illness in fiction is something very, uh, something dangerous, something that we need to be very careful about because, um, in a way, it does portray mental illness quite appropriately, but of course, it's still fiction, so there's it's not 100% accurate or true to reality. There's a again a heightened um, reality aspect, I think, to the whole book. Um, so Aza has a an anxiety disorder. Many people, including the author himself, claim this to be a form of OCD, obs obsessive compulsive disorder, which is um, psych psych the way that psychiatry would diagnose this patient. From psychoanalysis, which is my personal field, we would not diagnose OCD, but we would we would diagnose the same thing just under a different label, which would be. Uh, an obsessive compulsive neurosis, which is uh, pretty much it, it. Pretty much is perfectly well represented in this book. The patient has, well, the character I should say has um, compulsions and obsessions. That means uh, that this kind of anxiety presents itself in an almost psychotic way, uh, because that's the the definition of this kind of um, of disorder, OCD or uh, obsessive compulsive neurosis. Uh, the, the definition is that it is so severe that it actually borders sometimes on paranoid, hypochondriac, um, psychotic states, even though it's not a psychotic state because the patient is not psychotic in terms of their um, 
the foundations of their personality and their organization of their personality. It's it's not a psychotic psychotic patient. It's a neurotic patient, but it's so severe, um, and what we call egocentric or well, I'm not going to get into that kind of um, tangent. But it's so severe that it sometimes feels like the patient is actually more psychotic than neurotic. Um, the patient has extreme anxiety, anxieties of disintegration, anxieties of of dying, um, especially the character in this book, the patient or the character has acute feelings and certainties of uh, becoming ill and, and falling into a state of disrepair and dying. That's very common in OCD or uh, compulsive, um, uh, obsessive compulsive neurosis. Um, the patient is so paralyzed by this neurosis or this disorder that they cannot really function properly anymore. So I wanted to recommend this book because I think it's a somewhat truthful and somewhat accurate depiction of a mental illness. But still, I wanted to make this video also to have a discussion about mental illness because mental illness in the 21st century that we're living in has become both something that people hide, but but also people sometimes over-diagnose themselves and sometimes even clinicians over-diagnose their patients. Many people, I've seen and heard many people say, oh, I have OCD, and they don't have OCD. They might have an anxiety disorder, or they might have overwhelming feelings of stress sometimes in specific situations, but OCD is something extremely severe. It's something that, again, it's borderline, uh, it, 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 it's it's so severe. People don't really understand what it is. People sometimes say, oh, I'm so OCD, when really they are orderly people, very structured kinds of, of people, people who like to be very rigid. But that's not OCD. That's just a mild uh, trait of OCD. But OCD really is something horrible um, that is just a very severe psychopathology. And it's never something that we should downplay or something that we should see as, you know, something very common. OCD is not very common. These kinds of psychopathologies are very severe. Again, I'm saying this like a thousand times. I'm being very repetitive, but I really want to say that um, mental illness has become something very um, sort of dark that people sometimes hide and people sometimes don't get treatment because they are very afraid of dealing with it. But also, it's something that has become kind of common for people to say, oh, I have ADD, I have OCD, I have this and that and that. And it, it's really not that easy to come to this diagnosis. So I wanted to say that. Um, something that I really liked about this book, even though I, I didn't love this book, I gave it three stars, but I think it's imp an important read for many audiences. But something that I really liked was... Um, at some point in the novel, this is not a spoiler, but at some point late in the novel, the main character's friend tells her, you are so self-involved. You are so involved in your own anxiety and in your own disorder that you don't care about anyone or anything around you. And this, I think, is the most affecting and effective part of the novel because it's absolutely true. And that's what I really want to uh, commend John Green for because, you know, these kinds of pathologies, we can sometimes see them as uh, something to be pitied or something to be, you know, something that we should feel sorry for. And yes, in a way, of course, we want to pay attention and help those individuals find treatment and get better. But, in, but yes, th this character, I'm talking about the protagonist in this book exclusively, is an incredibly narcissistic patient. Um, actually, I would say that her anxiety disorder, to me as a clinician, would feel more as part of a narcissistic underlying 
personality structure. She is incredibly narcissistic and she's also using her OCD um, or, you know, her psychopathology as a, as a method of defending herself and protecting herself from something much more serious, which is um, the, the loss of her father and some other anxieties that are sort of underlying there. Something that we always try to do as clinicians and therapists is try to dig deeper. Don't just focus on the symptom, because if we focus on the symptom, then what we are doing is only cognitive therapy or behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, which is effective, but if we just, if, if we don't really dig deeper, then the patient will develop more symptomatology later or the symptoms will fade, but then we'll come back. That's why I don't really recommend cognitive behavioral therapy except for some kinds of diagnosis because I feel like those kinds of approaches can be somewhat shallow and superficial and they tend to focus more on eliminating the symptom. And when you focus exclusively on, on the symptom, you are only helping the patient alleviate the symptom. But the, the, the core anxiety, which is really producing the symptom in the first place, and the defenses that cause that symptom as well, they're not really being treated. And therefore, the symptom will change into something else or it will come back in the future. That's something that we know happens. Something that I found incredibly frustrating when reading Turtles all the way down was um, the character goes to therapy, but she is not a good therapist. Um, I don't know if this was John Green's deliberate intention, portraying a therapist that is not very effective to this patient, or it was just something uh, not deliberate. He just tried to portray therapy sessions with this patient and this therapist. But in my personal, completely biased, subjective opinion, I thought this therapist was just awful. I don't think she was the right therapist for this kind of uh, disorder. Um, this kind of uh, therapist is your very stereotypical image of a cold, inhumane, person with a poker face, completely sort of, you know, um, planted in reality, only focusing on symptoms, only focusing on providing the patient with medicine, um, psychopharmological drugs, which don't really help except for alleviating the symptoms, which is very important. But she just focuses on alleviating the symptoms. Therefore, helicopter? Can you hear that helicopter? I'm sorry. She just focuses on alleviating the symptoms and it's not even working with this patient. She's just getting very, um, she's distrusting um, of her therapist. She doesn't trust her and she doesn't feel empathy or she doesn't feel like the therapist actually cares about her. And that's my main problem with this kinds of therapists. I'm not saying that cognitive behavioral therapy doesn't work. Of course it works, but it, it, it helps to alleviate symptoms, which can sometimes be necessary, and it also helps the patient um, manage some situations, which is very important. But cognitive behavioral therapy and all of the therapies that focus on this kinds of work, they can help the patient up to a certain point. Beyond that, you really need something deeper, something more profound, something where the therapist really knows how to help the patient really analyze and understand what is really causing the pain. Now, I am a psychoanalyst, so of course, I am completely biased because being a psychoanalyst myself, I do believe that psychoanalytical and psychodynamically oriented treatments are much better. That's just my opinion. You can take it or leave it. I mean, uh, there are pros and cons to every kind of therapy out there. My kind of treatment also has its pros and cons. It's, it has its, um, you know, its, uh, its ups and downs. I mean, no therapy is perfect. 
But I do think that for this kind of patient, this was not the right therapist. I mean, I really, really disliked the portrayal of the, the therapist in this book because she was completely cold, inhumane, only focusing on the symptoms and on the medicine, the, the medical uh, treatment, and it's just not effective. That's not how therapy works. And that's also why I wanted to make this video because I think this video made me want to talk to you guys watching out there, what, to tell you about th this is not therapy. I mean, the portrayal of therapy in the media is incredibly different and inaccurate to what it really is in real life. So as a therapist myself, I can tell you that therapists are usually very warm people who are not necessarily focused on helping you deal with things with less anxiety. We are focused on develop developing a relationship with our patients and from that relationship, really trying to understand what the patient is dealing with. And then we can really help them to alleviate symptoms, understand themselves, themselves better, handle themselves better and manage whatever it is that they're going through in a much better way and also to become more creative and more in touch with themselves. One of my favorite psychoanalysts used to say that what we do as analysts or as therapists is to reacquaint the patient with that person with whom they have the most dealings with themselves. And that's really what I want you to take away from this video. Therapy is something really warm and creative and funny and and sometimes sometimes hard, but it's something that can really help you. So that's my discussion. It's not really a review. It's just a discussion on turtles all the way down. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you can comment down below. Um, and also I wanted to recommend another book for further reading because this kind of psychopathology that we see depicted in the novel is becoming more frequent. Anxiety disorders, depression, depressive kind of disorders, um, and narcissistic disorders are becoming more frequent and prevalent in the few in in the in, I was going to say in the future in this in the twenty first century and also in the future it will probably keep on growing and I wanted to recommend this book that I have only just started reading which is um, cynical theories how activist scholarship made everything about race gender and identity and why this harms everybody by helen pluckrose and james lindsay i think this book is really wonderful it's incredibly clear very academic really well researched and it completely makes sense to me because it talks about postmodernism and how you know something that we're talking in psychoanalytic uh feels uh, a lot now is how postmodernism has brought a very specific uh, wave of psychopathologies uh, to our consulting rooms. Um, these are the so-called postmodern psychopathologies, which include this kind of uh, psychopathology right here. So uh, if you're interested in postmodernism and what it causes, uh, in terms of the psychopathological side of things, um, this might be good reading. Thanks for watching. I am Just One Reader, and I will see you on the next video.